So I work for a group within, uh, or a company within Paracol Consulting. This uh, morning you heard um, from Paracol.org, and uh, Fearsome Engine is a group within the sister company called Paracol Consulting. And um, we build intelligent dialogue agents. Now I'll, I'll clarify in a bit exactly what that is, but uh, our focus is specifically on um, building the workflow engine with lo loads of custom integration so that we can build these systems um, to integrate with, with your, your back ends. And our, fo our other focus is on the custom NLU so that we can add the languages that uh, we need. Um, I'm not going to... I'm going to skip this slide. If you want to see my bio, it, it is on the um, website. <clears throat> and I'll give a bit of an intro to the, the problem that uh, we're solving. Uh, as I said, I'll explain a bit what is a dialogue engine or a dialogue agent. And then I will um, give an overview of a little bit of the machine learning aspects that uh, I think is important for this talk but it will kind of um, alternate it with what the, the service looks like. So if I can keep everyone uh, interested. And uh, as, as you heard, please ask questions um, if you like, and I'll, within the talk, I'll give specific opportunities for, for questions. <clears throat> and we're kind of working on, on the premise that uh, your next thousand or your next million or your next billion customers will demand prompt service. They will expect you to have the context of uh, their problems so that you can solve it quickly, and they will value you speaking in their language. And they will likely interact with you via the phone, the thing that's in their pocket and with them all the time. This is, of course, also an opportunity to connect to more people and um, .org uh, presented on, on that um, well, quite well this morning. You, you might want to provide uh, life coaching to more people. You might want to provide them with healthy eating advice. And I say spef specifically more people to show that we want to scale this up. We want to reach a much lo larger audience than um, we currently do. And yes, this sounds a lot like a chatbot, but I do have a, have a definition for you. There's a, a slight blurry line between chatbot and dialogue agent. And um, a task-oriented dialogue agent typically refers to a agent um, that uh, you have a short interaction with specifically to accomplish some tasks. So it, it kind of helps you out to do something quicker or um, smarter, while a chatbot is more um, typically a um, or more typically mimics the way you speak to uh, another human. So it's um, according to this definition, often for entertainment purposes, but it doesn't have to be. Any longer interaction is typically called a, a chatbot. And there's a, a nice book by Dan Jarofsky and um, James Martin, Speech and Language Processing. It's uh, available online, so if you Google it, you'll, you'll find uh, at least a draft of it. Um, I don't think it's quite ready to be published yet. Uh, but I can recommend that if anyone wants to um, kind of start um, learning about natural language processing. Um, so I've kind of mentioned automation, that the fact that your, your client or your user wants to access this service, this product of yours anytime, anywhere, um, and at, at, at scale. Um, they expect you to, to have the context, so they expect a, a personalized service. And um, local vernacular is important, because as I mentioned, it, we, we work on the premise that um, your user will value the fact that you speak to them in, in their own language. But also this is delivered over a, a text medium, and you can include buttons and, photo, and photos and so on, uh, even voice notes. And you can support voice um, when you need to. So when you need to interact with a virtual agent via voice, let's say you can't use your hands, um, that's maybe 
the requirement. And of course, you can include computer vision when you need to. Maybe you want to recognize some logo, you want to do, um, you want to fill in some images and automatically process that or triage that. And for the most part of this presentation, I'm going to speak about the automation aspect. Um, and for autom automation, we're kind of using natural language understanding. So the approach we're taking is to use machine comprehension uh, to understand the text. Um, you might want to triage what your, your user's problem is so that you can direct them either to an automated system or to a, a real human. And the goal is kind of to have 90% of the cases that, that the, can be automated, have that handled by your um, agent, and 10% uh, of cases that require um, more attention, that more the more complex cases you can kind of hand off to a, a real human. And this is also typically what you can, can expect. A, a person might say, um, transfer 150 Rand to my savings account and do it tomorrow or do it next week. And in this, um, in this you can kind of um, start getting an idea of the kind of tasks you'll have to have to do to automate this. And typically, we separate that into text language identification, uh, intent detection, so trying to figure out, is this a payment request? Is this a, a question the person is asking? And then once you know the intent, you want to extract information. So if you know it's a, like in this case, a transfer intent, you want to extract at least maybe the amount, uh, who this person is paying, and if there's a, a time associated to it, like in this case, uh, tomorrow. But intent detection is also a way for your user to navigate the service journey. So in, in this case, you can see the user, Sean, has gone past signing. He's authenticated. Now he's presented with a the decision point in the journey where he has to decide, um, in this case, do you want to uh, uh, pay your account? Do you want to ask a question? Do you have some, some problem? And if the person says, what is my balance? Then that automatically sends him down that specific um, part of the service journey. Um, it's useful to, to add that this is a, a type of text classification, and it's trained by example. Um, I don't know how many of you have played around with um, uh, intent detectors and entity extractors, but I have a short video. Um, if that wants to start playing. That's the problem. You test this and it works, and then. Okay, I'm not going to spend too much time on trying to get it playing. But what you would have seen here is that the user or, or the person that's training this text classifier gives a, a couple of examples of what a greeting might, might is it playing? Yeah, it's oh, sorry, it's not playing on my screen. Um, good. So you can go see, and there it gives. Um, examples of complements, and then once you've given some examples of how each of the, these intents might be might be uttered by your user, you can start testing it. And uh, the more of these examples you add, the smarter this classifier becomes. So this is just a, a basic example to kind of give you an idea that this is trained by example. And underlying to this there is a language model. Um, what I show here is an example of a, a very shallow language model, but still the um, chatbot or the dialogue agent knows that the relationship between king and queen is similar to the relationship between man and woman, for example. It, 
um, gathers that association from looking at many pieces of, of text and kind of training what, what's this low dimensional um, structure to the language. And the same, it can, for example, um, identify that walking is to walk as uh, swimming is to swim. And um, I've seen examples where the, some of the little bit deeper language models actually learn like Paris is to France what Pretoria is to South Africa, for example. They, they learn those, those deeper um, associations as well. Uh, some of the, the deeper language models that you might have heard of uh, recently is uh, GPT-2 from um, OpenAI that came up in the news uh, last week or the week before. So uh, to summarize this, this first section, um, we're using automation to scale up, NLU to support automation, and um, intent detection is a type of text classification trained by example, and that is a little bit important uh, later on, and that there are some language models um, underneath all of this natural language understanding. So at, at this point, is there any questions on that, those first few uh, slides? Yeah. While I'm walking, I've got a question. Uh, how much of the challenge of the fact that we have so many national languages in South Africa, does that play into the time effort required to train models for serving South Africans? Yeah, so you kind of have to set up your language model for your specific vertical, for your specific user group that, that you want to um, service. And it is um, often quite difficult to get enough data to build a, a, a deep language model for that, yeah. So, so I was just wondering, if an agent is linked to like short conversation, how do you typically limit the interaction on, say, something like WhatsApp? So what's the response if I send a long story? Um, you would typically attempt to, to get the user back to your service journey, because in the background there's a specific service journey, and you kind of want to direct the user to, to that journey, and they must, of course, know what they are able to do within that, that service. So there should be specific um, actions you take to, to get them back onto that. That's one way of to, yeah, to tell them, yes, if you want a straight answer, please ask a good question. Yeah. yeah, I just have a question about, so about the different languages. So what about if you're like me and you're not the greatest in Afrikaans? So say you're servicing uh, someone who's speaking Afrikaans and they use English words as well. Uh, can it handle things like that? Um, yeah, so that's related to the first question. You have to make sure that, that you train your language model for that use case. So if you have a language model that's not trained for, for, for mixed um, language or um, switching language, then uh, you have to make sure that you fine tune it f for that. Uh, I think one, one more. That's fine. Hi. Um, so you mentioned the GPT-2 model. Um, which OpenAI decided to not release because they cited fake news generation. Yeah. Um, I know that the academic community sort of disagreed with that quite strongly. Um, what's the sort of more corporate view on, on them citing fear of fake news and things like that to not release models? Um, as far as I can gather, that, that was an exercise in responsible release, which was a little bit twisted in the media into no, they don't want to release it out of fear. Um, but that's, that's only my guess. Um, thank you. So I'm going to speak a bit more now about the service side of um, our cloud NLU service. And there we use uh, Swagger. And I'm glad it was mentioned earlier um, in the conference as well. It's now known as uh, the Open API specification. And along with connection, you can directly from your Swagger spec kind of spin up a server. You don't have to go and write uh, lots of Flask code, uh, which is quite convenient. And then we also use Swagger CodeGen to generate the client-side wrappers that you would use 
to access that this is API from, from Python or from Java or from C++. And this is what the YAML spec looks like. Now, it's okay if you can't read what's in there. Um, the point is that, that for each endpoint in your YAML spec, you kind of describe what the inputs and outputs is of that uh, operation, and then you give it a um, operation ID, which is eventually used to call out to your Python code. So all you have to do in Python is go and implement, um, for example, in this case, the text classifier create operation method. Uh, you don't have to write any other Flask code. Uh, it also spins up a nice UI, a Swagger UI, that um, you can use as kind of a, a quick user manual to your API. Uh, for example, this uh, API was broken up into uh, tags or, or sections, and each section you can then um, expand on to see all of the endpoints within that, and within, um, for each of those endpoints you can kind of expand it further and start interacting with it. You can authenticate yourself via the UI, you can start providing inputs to the um, API and, and see what, how it behaves. Uh, I don't know how many people are, are using Swagger and connection. A couple, okay, cool. Um, same with the API language wrappers that, that are generated. You can, for example, just say once you have the spec, you can do a Swagger code gen. You generate your um, uh, wrappers either then for, for Python or for C++, you specify the language, and then what you get is a Python API, so you don't have to write any HTTP requests. You can just say API instance dot intent classifier create, for example, and all of these models and so on are also automatically created for you. <coughs> Um, so, to summarize, we use a, a Swagger API spec a connection to spin up a, a Flask uh, app. Flask calls out to all of our models that we've implemented uh, directly, and you can use this for generating uh, language wrappers in, uh, for Python, for JavaScript, and so on. Um, any questions on, on this aspect? Okay, then I'll go on to the computer resources that one can uh, typically expect to, to spend on, on natural language understanding. Uh, a model like an intent classifier or text classifier in general typically takes between one and five milliseconds to execute. So you can expect, say, kind of 200 requests per second from, from that model. However, a good language model is about one gigabyte in size. Um, some, some are a little bit bigger. If you don't have a lot of language data, it's a lot smaller. But uh, one gigabyte, gigabyte is, a, is a good um, size to have in mind for a language model. And if you want to include all local, all of our, our local languages at least, then it's um, about 11 gigabytes worth of language model. Um, that you have to have in memory. Now, luckily, these language models are um, used in a read-only uh, way during inference or, or um, during operations. So you don't have to go and, and write to this, and you can share the memory between processes, but it is something to um, take note of, at least. And um, to scale this up, now, the service uh, it's quite easy to make multi-tenant if you have an API key or so on. It, it's not difficult to make it multi-tenant. But uh, to scale it up, we kind of want to run an instance per call. Uh, a, lot of it, a lot of it is still Python. So you um, run into the interpreter lock, um, and you kind of need to have an instance per, uh, a process per instance. And we used uh, SQL Alchemy as our, our central data store. Um, we do make use of, of partial reads and caching, so the data overhead, the central database overhead, is not, not that high, luckily. And of course, uh, Nginx or Varnish for load balancing. <coughs> uh, Varnish did give us a little bit 
uh, a few problems. So I prefer engine X uh, as a load balancer. And of course, since it's in production, we run Flask on something like G Unicorn or, or so. Uh, and salary um, for anything like training or testing or any operation that might take a little bit longer than one to five uh, milliseconds. We did some performance test tests. Uh, the, the, this is from a report, but the red line is the important one. Um, this green line we kind of ran into in our testing code was, was in Python. Um, so I added this um, during the previous presentation. Life's too short to not write some C++. <laughs> Me, I, I said that. Because <laughs> uh, we, we found that, that there was just a little bit too much overhead in the, on the Python side, but writing the tests in C++, um, we could easily get over 1,000 uh, requests per second from a, um, a bunch of, of instances communicating to, to one database instance. And um, you can, of course, for each tenant, spin up a database um, just for them if you, if you need to um, replicate as well for more scale. Um, yeah, so as I, as I mentioned, uh, to scale up, we used a central database, uh, Flask, um, oh, SQL Alchemy in our case, uh, multiprocess because Python, Nginx, and um, Unicorn and Salary. Uh, it turned out to be quite easy to get 200 requests per second, and it scaled pretty well to um, uh, easily to 1,000 requests per database instance. And um, yeah, as I said, we can deploy a database instance per tenant if we need to, to scale beyond, beyond that. Um, after this, I'm going to go into a little more a little bit more detail on the machine learning side. Is there any questions on this before I, before I continue? OK, thanks. Um, so this is typically what a deep learning model looks like. The input is on your left, <coughs> and the output, the, the final classification, is on your right. And through in the entire neural network, the data is transformed in a, um, in a, a couple of ways. There's different types of neural networks. There's um, layers in the network that um, pool information, kind of reduce the, the um, dimensionality of it, or increase the dimensionality of it, depending on, on what you want to do. And then there's usually this final layer, way on, on the right-hand side, that is eventually the classifier. Um, so in the text context, your first part of the network kind of learns to identify things like engrams um, or word engrams, so it's character groups and word groups. And eventually in the last feature layers, you get interesting things like um, sentiment or part of speech tags or meaning associations between words, um, king to queen, uh, man to woman, those types of, of relationships. And then if you want to adapt this, let's say we want to change this classifier from classifying greetings and compliments to something else, you can do what's called reshaping, where you change this last layer of the network. So you might want to have fewer outputs. And um, in that case, you just have to retrain that last bit of, of the network. And just to maybe put this into a, a visual perspective, this is kind of what you can expect a vision system to learn. At the earlier layers in the network, it learns to detect um, features like um, edges, uh, gradients in the image, basic colors. Then towards the, the center of your, your feature detector, it starts learning uh, combinations of gradients, uh, patterns, checker patterns, circles, and so on. 
and towards the right hand side of the feature part it starts learning how to um, detect parts of objects um, two eyes make a face or um, uh, a wheel is part of a car those types of, of associations and then as well if you want to change for example your network from a classifier of objects to a, a driving simulation you have to reshape that last part of the network so you supply some new training data you retrain just that last, last part a bit and you, you get your new type of classifier now the, the problem with this is that um, you typically when you do transfer learning from one classifier to another you kind of reach this performance plateau where um, this is a graph of loss over um, epoch so how many cycles you've trained this network given fresh uh, training data and you see that you reach this plateau at in this case about 0 0.5 loss and that translates maybe to a 90 percent accuracy so it means your your new model is never more accurate than 90 percent so you're wrong one in 10 times which is um, in many cases not not acceptable so you can do what's called fine tuning where you would not just retrain that that last part of the network but you would maybe retrain also the uh, given your specific vertical retrain also the sentiment and part speech tags and exactly how word meanings uh, how words relate to each other in, in terms of meaning or you can go further and retrain more of of uh, the network so that you in fact redefine how uh, character combinations and word combinations are, are interpreted for that specific vertical and then you'll likely find something like this where you reshape and you train for a bit and then you see okay you, you might you maybe have to fine-tune the, the earlier part of the network as well but the benefit of that is that you can then get your um, network performance to the point where it was for the, the, the original classification problem so in this case you can get um, your loss all the way down to almost zero and maybe go from a 90% accuracy to a 99.5% accuracy so you're only wrong in uh, less than one in a hundred times if this is uh, of interest to you there's a uh, a cool paper um, and post by Sebastian Ruder on um, the ImageNet moment of NLP. And ImageNet is a um, computer vision uh, database that's used for training, but it's also a um, a challenge, uh, a, a thousand class classification challenge that was standing for many years, and suddenly, using transfer learning, people were able to kind of um, achieve much higher accuracy, accuracies than before and sometime around middle last year that kind of also happened for natural language processing where you can make use of these deep language models um, as a, a pre-trained model and transfer maybe do a bit of fine-tuning uh, all of that inf information that has been has been learned um, so the, the fine-tuning pro is, of course, that you can improve performance, but there are a couple of cons as well, and one of them is that it, it takes a lot longer to uh, train this model, uh, obviously, because now I have to train that entire um, you, uh, deep neural net uh, that did your feature classification for you. And... Um, it does mean that you now have one language model uh, per language per vertical so if you have say five different verticals you just have to remember that you need to have instead of 11 gigabytes worth of um, RAM to support the service you have to have five times that um, the future plans for the service is um, that 
which we'll keep incorporating in latest research, obviously. We'll soon uh, add what we're currently calling fearsome vision to kind of support the, those cases where you need to have the, the vision aspect um, automated as well. So if someone sends you an image, you can quickly have the agent look at it and do some triage or do some classification for you. And then we will also uh, continue making our, our, our tools to build all of this um, as intuitive and convenient to use as possible. Um, that's it. Any questions on on this? On, on all, of it, all of it, I guess. Is this the final questions now? Final questions, okay, yes. Cool. Any questions? While I'm walking over there, I had a question which was like, there's a whole, you can choose between building your own service from scratch, using somebody's service where you yeah. do all the work, and using a service that's been pre-trained. Can you just talk about what, especially in the South African context, when would you choose one of those options? Why would you choose to roll your own? Why would you yeah. choose this? Um, so, so we are building our own to add the languages we need. So the, um, the Googles and the Amazons don't offer all of the languages that, that we want to incorporate into our services. And the argument for fine tuning is you have to kind of test um, how much fine-tuning you have to do for the, the classification performance you want, want to reach. So maybe you find that you can do some reuse of uh, an existing model and that gives you adequate performance and then everyone's happy because there's, there's no um, fine-tuned model that takes up uh, additional memory. But it is likely that, for example, for health or for finance, you would want to fine-tune your language model so that you offer the best performance for that specific vertical and um, it might take more memory but it's it's worth it. Um, uh, want to, I would need to ask around the, um, uh, I saw you using n-grams on top of uh, a convolutional neural network uh, which is typically used for like say image processing uh, which is quite an interesting approach. Um, I'd like to know sort of how did you get to uh, get to that approach of using, like, say, convolutional neural networks for um, NLP, and also if you've done any assessments or comparisons between that approach and, say, recurrent neural networks, which typically work for context, um, mm -hmm. and also say LSA or LDA. What, what's the last one? Um, LSA and LDA, uh, latent Dirichlet allocation. Um, so what I try to show, sorry. Um, <clears throat> what I try to show here is that the language model kind of learns that there are things such as character pairs that are significant and are important and saying that it learns that there are words that, that go together. Tiger brands is a, a, a biogram. It's important as a, as a concept, for example. <clears throat> and same, the, the network kind of learns that sentiment is important for your, your end task, your classification problem. And people are still trying to understand exactly what the, the network is learning, because it's not as easy as in the visual case where you can easily see that it's rendering, or that it's um, understanding gradients image or, or parts of objects. The uh, language is a bit more abstract, so we're kind of guessing what it's learning, and there'll still be a lot of exciting research to be done to find out exactly why these features that the network learns um, by itself work so well. So I'm still expecting some, some more information there. Um, also with RNNs, th there's a, um, a battle between kind of the sequential type RNN model and the transformer type convolutional language models. I'm not sure which is best. I would say test both and, and see what, what works. Um, maybe you find that for some problems the RNN works best and use it. And maybe you find that the transformer with um, some modification works well in, in your domain. Um, 
in terms of, of LDA and th those techniques, I don't have a lot of experience with that. Uh, we've used some of that for, for topic modeling, uh, especially where you don't have uh, a lot of training data, and it, it worked quite well. Um, but you're welcome to come speak to me afterwards. Cool. One more question at the back, and then we'll break. Hi. Um, thanks for the talk. A uh, couple, uh, two questions. Uh, firstly, you mentioned your latency of one to five milliseconds. Uh, is that based on like a single request that you sent through, or did you batch your kind of requests together to achieve that throughput? That's on a single request. So, so typically for a live system, uh, you might not have, have opportunity to, to batch your requests. So that, that's per request. Um, and that's also why um, we often use CPUs for our production system anyway, because the GPU is good at, at batched high performance, but if you just run single queries, it's a millisecond. Um, uh, anyway. And the second question, um, could you go into some, so you, do you guys in production use the convolutional net? And if you do, um, how did you get enough data for the other languages? Uh, I guess, and then the, my last question, um, did you ever consider doing a translation task? Like, so instead of doing like 11 separate models, do one model and then translate <coughs> to that model for your community to be able to like make your pipeline more efficient? I'm just asking. Yeah. Um, that, that, that last way of translating between languages um, is referred to as, as pivoting. So we're not pivoting through English or some other language because we don't have the data to have a good translation. Um, and um, we typically collect as much data as we can, and we would use the, either a shallow model if we don't have a lot of language data, or we'd use a little bit deeper model if we have more language data, and the idea is to, in production, collect language data as we go on, and um, improve the language model as, as best we can. But we, we do have um, non-English languages in production, but many of those are under-resourced. So they would, you'd start out with a shallow model, and as you get more data, you can um, build it out.